Hi, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Mitch Stoltz. I'm a lawyer at the Electronic Frontier Foundation in San Francisco. We're a, a donor supported nonprofit. Um, changing gears a little bit here because uh, I'm going to be talking, uh, actually, trying to maybe teach you some law, and it's law that uh, impacts uh, probably a lot of your work and the uh, security and crypto uh, uh, research and practice in general. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about what we, EFF, are, are doing to try to remove this particular threat to uh, security research and security work. Um, uh, I am a lawyer. I'm not your lawyer unless you know differently. Uh, <laughs> um, and I'm a U.S. lawyer, so this talk is going to be a bit U.S. focused, but um, this particular law that I'm talking about, it's called Section 1201 of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, has equivalence in most developed countries, um, except Israel, interestingly. So I, I know there's, there's some folks from, it, from Israel here, so, so tov me'od, you do not have this particular threat when you're home, but anyone with sort of significant connections to the U.S. needs to know about this and, and, and may sort of have this, have an issue here. Um, Doing here. So, so, um, so what is this, the, uh, this law? This was passed in 1998, and this is the basic uh, piece of it right here, and it's sort of this adjunct to copyright law. So the, um, all of this that I'm talking about it has a connection to protection of creative work, including software. Um, it's not really specifically uh, like hacking law or computer intrusion law, but it does have this very specific tie to crypto, which, which, which I'll show you. Um, but the basis was in protecting creative work, including software, but also movies, music, any sort of creative work. And this is the basic, the, the, the heart of it here. Uh, uh, no person shall circumvent a technological measure that effectively controls access to a copyrighted work. What does that mean, right? Um, there, uh, couple of things here, right? So what's a copyrighted work? Again, that, that, that's, any, um, that's generally any form of creative work, including software, source code, object code, any kind of code. Um, and, then what is, and then what does circumvent technological measure mean? So the, 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 the law gives us that definition there. Um, you notice there's this very specific call out to decrypting an encrypted work. So if there's software or uh, 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 video, audio, uh, uh, prose, any, any other sort of creative work the, the, with, with some sort of access control on it and the, bypassing that access control involves decryption or also these wishy-washy things, avoid, bypass, remove, deactivate, very kind of loosely defined there. Um, you know, you can face liability under this law and it can be, it can be civil or criminal. There are pretty significant civil or criminal penalties on this and they have been used. It's not just not just not just words. Again, this was originally written with 1998 technology in mind, and, and specifically technology around traditional creative work. So this was the canonical example at the time was the encryption on DVDs um, and various kinds of digital audio encryption, none of which are really relevant anymore. <laughs> but the law is written really broadly. And then, and this is really kind of the most troubling part, is not just a ban on bypassing encryption or, or circumventing a technical measure in the, uh, in the terms. Also, this is, sometimes you'll hear the, the term DRM, digital rights management, digital restrictions management. This is, that's another term for these sorts of, uh, of, of controls. Often cryptographic, not always. But the even worse part, really, is this part here, because this bans manufacturing, importing, or again, this wishy-washy word, other provider otherwise traffic in any technology, product, service, device, component, or part thereof. Um, this has been used against researchers, against the, the discussion or delivery of uh, information about one of these systems, about crypto systems that are used in this way. Um, that's really troublesome because it affects really kind of the very thing we are all doing here and the very thing that a lot, that, that a lot of you do in, in, your, in your day to day. And this is exactly what we saw. So this law that was written to, to um, uh, 
add an extra level of safeguard to things like DVDs and the, the emerging digital entertainment media of the 1990s was very quickly in, the, in 2000 and 2001 it begun to be used against uh, uh, security and encryption research. Um, many of you have probably heard of some of these. So the, so the, um, the uh, research, this was in uh, 2000, I believe it was 2000, the, the research team assembled by Professor Edward Felton at Princeton uh, and with some other institutions involved that was looking into uh, an audio watermarking scheme called SDMI. Uh, but when, and they found flaws in that scheme, as, as with many forms of audio water, watermarking. Um, and they wanted to present that at a conference, and they got uh, a threat of a civil lawsuit from the, some of the, the, the company that had uh, developed this, the, this protocol. And they, they did eventually give that talk, but, it, but, but, but not in the forum they wanted. It was delayed. They were censored in that sense. Um, they, 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 would, they had originally withdrawn their paper from that conference. Um, the, the, the 2600 magazine uh, lawsuits, again, this is probably familiar to some of you, I know, but maybe not everyone, so, so the, the 2600 magazine published the algorithm f for decrypting DVDs, or one that had been independently developed. Um, they were sued, and the con in the, at the conclusion of that lawsuit, they were banned from ever publishing this algorithm or linking to any website that published this algorithm. This is really gets at the heart of a sort of a restriction on speech of the sort that U.S. law is really very allergic to, a notion that this is, this is a, a magazine, this is, a journal, this is journalism, and that magazine is forever banned from uh, giving true information about a subject uh, that was, uh, at least at the time, very important to the, to the public. Um, this was a this was a ban on this was a a restriction on the free press. Um, that's really a serious matter, at least in the uh, uh, under un, under U.S. law and in, and in many other places too. And then um, also around that time uh, was um, Dmitry Sklyarov, who, who had had worked on a company called Elcomsoft. He was a, a Russian citizen who had worked on a, a software that manipulated Adobe ebook files. Um, and in the process, uh, uh, bypassed the encryption on those files. Um, he uh, had come to give a talk uh, in the U.S. at DEF CON. He was arrested. He spent several weeks in prison um, because he had worked on this software. Uh, pretty disturbing stuff. Um, and the courts at the time, the EFF was involved at the time, and the courts at the time in the, in the 2600 case really kind of uh, um, dismissed and, and uh, shut out our arguments about the, the importance of freedom of speech. Um, and they said, that they, they said that really doesn't concern us here. The result of these and uh, many other cases was I think a lot of self-censorship. Now I'm not going to ask, but I suspect that many of you have experienced this or, or know people who have. Um, things you haven't discussed or, or papers you haven't delivered or have thought twice about delivering um, because of the possibility that they might run afoul of laws like these, if not in a criminal sense, then, then in drawing threats of lawsuits and the possibility of federal litigation, which no one likes. It's ugly. Um, we've collected all of these in this paper. It's called Un the Unintended Consequences Report. Um, uh, going by this, uh, the, uh, the most current version we have of this is from 2014. Uh, uh, we really should be updating it at this point. But, uh, but, but this is uh, where it's at. These and many more examples. Um, it, if Google EFF Unintended Consequences, you, you will, you, you'll, you'll get right to this. Um, OK, bright side, at least sort of a bright side. Uh, is that the law does uh, pretend to express a concern for encryption research and security research more generally. Um, and if you just read this part of it, it looks pretty good. Right? It says, this, it's not a violation for a person to circumvent a technological measure in the course of an act of good faith encryption research. That sounds pretty good, right? Uh, but then you get to the rest of this. So, so. The factors to be considered shall include, and this is this litany of things, and it's always looking at, well, was this, re you know, are you advancing the state of knowledge or development of encryption technology, or are you facilitating a violation of law? Well, 
first of all, what if you're doing both, or what if someone else violates the law based on something you've said, or, and then there's this, this, this second one here, are you engaged in a legitimate course of study, or are you appropriately trained or experienced? Um, lawyers love this stuff, right? A lawyer looks at, at language like this, and if visions of billable hours are dancing in their heads. <laughs> But, but, but for people in the real world, what, what you don't see in here is uh, a set of steps that you can follow that will protect you, uh, a set of steps that, that will give you an assurance that, that, that you're not going to be sued or, 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 or that you're not reasonably going to be sued. There's no, there's no real sort of uh, safe harbor in here. Uh, it's wishy-washy, and that means, uh, that means expensive litigation. Uh, that means, again, a lot of uh, potential for self-censorship. Um, there's a similar one, by the way, for, uh, for security testing rather than encryption research, but it's got, all, it's got it's kind of this, this, this same wishy-washy, we'll, we'll balance all of these things. Remember, this balancing is get, gets done by uh, either a judge or a, or a jury uh, of lay people, so, uh, right, not, not by experts. Um, there's another way to, in theory, protect against these sorts of legal threats, and that's uh, administrative process. Every three years, the U.S. Copyright Office, which is part of the U.S. Library of Congress, um, holds a proceeding, which is it's, it's complex. It takes about a year and a half, uh, and it's sort of like a court case, uh, and it's quite expensive. Uh, 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 we put a lot of resources into this, and we have, uh, you know, every three years for, for, for many years now. Many other organizations do, too, but what results from these is temporary exemptions to the ban on circumventing access controls. In the most recent cycle, this is what we got. Um, and it really suffers from the same problems as, as the, the permanent one that I just showed you. It's a, it's a permission from the U.S. government to circumvent solely for the purpose of good faith security research, only for these three categories of things. And again, you know, a government process here, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So a, a, a device or machine primarily designed for use by individual consumers, including voting machines. Uh, okay, voting machines, good. I'm not sure if those are consumer devices, but we'll take it, right? Like land vehicles and implantable medical devices not actually intended for use by patients. So, I mean, these are good things, but, but they're, they're, drawn, they're all drawn pretty narrowly, and they don't cover um, a lot of really security critical applications of encryption. <laughs> Um, and then same kind of really kind of narrow and subjective and, and, and not very reassuring caveats on this thing. Uh, it has to be done in a controlled environment designed to avoid any harm to individuals or the public. No one really knows what that means. You know, it really it would take a court, to, you know, and probably a couple of years of litigation to even figure out what that means. So beforehand, it's pretty hard to know whether, you know, whose work, you know, qualifies as a controlled environment. The other thing is this one is only going to last two years. They actually delayed this by a year. We don't even get the full three. They wanted to give other government agencies uh, an entire year to weigh in on this in case anyone else had any problems with this. So this only took effect uh, in October of 2016, and it will only last until the end of 2018. We're going to ask for a renewal, but, but you know, that's, that's no guarantee. So, Congress could fix this, right? I mean, we've been telling them the problems for many years. Um, there actually have been some good proposals for this, and a couple of them have even been introduced as bills. Um, the best one simply says, if, you're, if you are circumventing encryption, or even uh, discussing or teaching how to circumvent encryption for a legal purpose, you know, where, where there's, you're not intending that anyone break the law, that you're not trying to break the law, that you're not doing anything illegal or nefarious with these things, then it should be legal to, to, to do it and to discuss it. Um, leadership in Congress, though, we're hearing crickets and not really expecting uh, any motion on that in the near future. Hoping, but, but, but not realistically expecting. So, from our point of view, something else 
something else needs to be done. And uh, when you, you know, the phrase, when, you, when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Well, uh, lawyers, the tool that we look to often is lawsuits. That's not actually the only tool that we, that we have, but it's, it's one of our favorites. And in the US, uh, you know, there is a mechanism for this because courts have the power to strike down laws that don't comport with the US Constitution. Which leads to the challenge that we're working on right now, a, a constitutional challenge under the First Amendment the, uh, to, the, to the US Constitution against Section 1201. Uh, the name of the case is Green versus Department of Justice. Um, broadly, what we're saying is this case, uh, this law is one that doesn't comport with the, the First Amendment's guarantee of free speech and a free press. I'll give you a little bit of background about how this works. Um, as I mentioned before, in the early days of Section 1201, um, some of the, some of the uh, federal courts out in, in California were, were pretty dismissive of the free speech argument. They said, we, we, really, we, don't, we don't see this here, um, even though um, 2600 Magazine was, was uh, banned from ever discussing this uh, particular encryption algorithm or even linking to others who did. Um, they said, you know, that's, that's okay with us. But something else happened in the meantime. The U.S. Supreme Court decided a couple of uh, copyright cases and they said something interesting. They said, copyright law has some built-in First Amendment safeguards. They're built into the law. And you know, these are things some of you may have heard of here, they, uh, but, but they're called the, the, the fair use doctrine and the idea expression doctrine. Fair use is the idea that you can use other people's work without permission in certain circumstances. Often, uh, if it's a smaller portion, a small portion of that work, um, and or if it's for educational purposes, for purposes of building new things, creating new knowledge, new creativity. Um, and interestingly enough, one of those purposes uh, that the courts have identified is building interoperable software or, or furthering the, the notion of uh, building new software that interoperates with existing software. So that's, that's, that's one of the things that makes copyright consistent with the um, Constitution's guarantee of free speech. Um, the other one, the idea expression, basically that means copyright law doesn't control ideas and doesn't protect ideas. Patents do some to, to some degree. Copyright doesn't. You can always look at someone else's work and use the ideas from it to build something new, so build your own. Um, and those are, important part, those are important parts of guarantee of free speech. Uh, because uh, uh, there, there, there are limitations on the uh, private uh, copyright owner, so an author or a software developer or something, they, they, their ability to, to, to um, control what happens with their work. But um, Section 1201, the, the DMCA, um, interferes with this. Um, the Supreme Court said, if so, or at least suggested, that if something goes beyond these, if, if it interferes with these traditional contours of copyright protection, that's again, fair use, um, and, and the, the idea that, 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 you can't, that you cannot protect ideas, but only the, the, the expression of ideas, a law that interferes with those probably also violates the First Amendment because, the, because those are First Amendment protections. Well, guess what? Section 1201 does exactly that, which leads to our case. We filed this this past summer, and it is currently in court. Uh, plaintiffs, uh, in this case, Dr. Matthew Green from Johns Hopkins, who was here yesterday. I, I, I understand he couldn't be here today, but I know many of you uh, many many of you know him, and he works on. Um, security research in a variety on a variety of different fields and products. Not all of them are are consumer products, automobiles, or medical devices. So he is, um, to some degree, outside of these things that we got a temporary two-year protection for. Um, and uh, 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 Andrew Bunny Wong, who uh, is a software developer and engineer, he actually lives in Singapore. He's working on, um, among many other projects, uh, some devices 
that allow people to manipulate home video and kind of almost bring back the concept of a VCR, the, the, the ability to manipulate and share um, digital video uh, in the way that we used to be able to do with analog video. This is a, it's, this is a product that he wants to build called the, uh, uh, he calls the, the net VCR, and it, but it involves decrypting uh, the encryption in the HDCP uh, protocol that's, I forget what that stands for, but it's the, it's, it's the protocol that, that, that um, uh, protects video traveling between home devices, digital video, uh, over an HDMI cable. Um, um, and his, Alpha Max LLC is his company. Both of them um, are concerned about the possibility of, you know, of criminal prosecution under Section 1201 in the U.S. This is the, I'm going to talk broadly about what, uh, you know, how this, how this lawsuit goes and how we've, uh, 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 how we've, we've laid it out. Um, uh, it's called a, it's, it's a, it's a constitutional challenge to the law. So what we're asking for, we're asking the court to uh, declare this law to be unconstitutional and order the government not to enforce it. Um, this, is, this, is the, this is the broad overview, and I'll go into a little bit of detail on this. Um, but it's, it's that Section 1201 doesn't accommodate fair use, again, which is, which is part of the guarantee of free speech. Section 1201 is overbroad. It, it interferes with more speech than it needs to and that this three-year exemption process, um, which we've used, which uh, Professor Green attempted to use, um, but that doesn't really give the protections that, 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 he, that he needs or, or, or that, that any of these folks need, um, they were saying the, um, this process is actually a, a speech licensing regime. And the courts have dealt with these before, right? There is, um, in, the, in the US, we're, we're, we're building on what's come before, and there is, um, uh, pretty, uh, uh, pretty strong restrictions imposed by the First Amendment on government uh, processes that give licenses to people for speech. I'll get a little bit more into that. Um, on the first part, just on the, on the law itself, the ban on circumvention, why, is the, why does this violate the First Amendment? Well, code is speech. This, um, courts have said this. This is pretty well established at this point. This actually came out of the challenges to the uh, crypto export licensing regime of the 1990s. 1999, the uh, uh, appeals court said, code is speech, and uh, export rules that restricted the, the posting of uh, uh, crypto code on, uh, on web pages was an, was an unconstitutional restriction on speech. Um, so that's pretty well established at this point. Um, DMCA 1201, also restrict, uh, restrict speech because it, it interferes with the sort of research that, that, that our plaintiffs are doing and even on, dis potentially on discussion of their research, again going back to what happened to 2600 Magazine. And circumvention is a necessary predicate to speech. So in the past courts have said uh, you can't indirect, the, the government can't indirectly uh, limit speech by uh, limiting the, uh, the availability of printer's ink or by limiting the uh, funding for uh, nonprofit organizations or the, or, 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 or the press um, or by limiting, um, in some cases, reporters' access to things or citizens' access to, to recording uh, public meetings or law enforcement. So, so you can't, if, the, if, if where these things are necessary predicates to speech, the government can't restrict those either. Uh, and so where do um, the ability to decrypt, or the ability to talk about decryption is a necessary predicate to uh, research and, 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 and having these sorts of discussions and doing, the, and, and doing this work, then, then there, are, there are restrictions on speech. Um, and then this is the, really the core, about, the core of a, a First Amendment argument in, in, in many cases is any law that restricts speech has to be written as narrowly as possible. Uh, and again, this one isn't. Um, and we give examples, but uh, uh, this, this restricts a lot more speech than necessary, particularly because it's not tied to illegal behavior. Um, 12, uh, Section 1201 uh, makes illegal the um, activities that you know that aren't that don't necessarily lead to any other illegal activities. So we're not 
promoting or encouraging copyright infringement or you know, illegal intrusion into other systems or uh, uh, insert whatever other sorts of legal violations we can think of. We're, that's, we're not going there. Uh, that's, so that makes the law too broad. Um, and then finally I mentioned about the um, uh, the, the uh, speech licensing regime. The, 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 what, the way you think of in comparison here is um, permits for demonstrations, permits for street marches, um, various sorts of licensing. Um, these happen. Um, what the First Amendment says and what the courts have said about these things is that they, is that they have to be fast and they have to be based on very specific uh, criteria so that government officials can't use them arbitrarily or to make uh, sort of arbitrary distinctions. Um, this three-year process is neither of those. Um, research that someone wants to do now, papers that people want to give, is really no comfort to say, you, you, you know, well, you can apply for an a, a, a exemption uh, in 2018 to be able to do this. Um, and that the criteria for actually getting those is a bit arbitrary, right? It's, um, um, in fact, the, the Copyright Office tends to move the goalposts on these things. Um, that's the shape of our lawsuit. Um, happy to take questions about this. I think I, we're just about out of time, but, but I'll, be, I'll be here. And um, uh, we are hopeful that the, 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 the court is going gonna, is, is gonna to take this where it needs to go. Great. Thanks, Mitch. Yeah. Um, if you could flip yeah. back to one of the first couple slides where you have the uh, text of the basic anti-circumvention provision. Yeah. Oops. Talk through it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, anyway, I, I was wondering if you could shed light on what the phrase effectively controls means. Um, one of the favorite <laughs> arguments of people who like to play lawyer on internet message boards um, mm -hmm. is this particular piece of DRM is so incompetently written that it can't be considered an effective control. Um, and I have my doubts that such an argument would ever hold up in court, but I'm wondering if there's any sort of precedent there. Um, you, are, you are closer to right than they are. The, um, <laughs> The, what, what very, the courts have said very little about this, but what, but what they've said, uh, remember they're not technologists, and uh, what they've said is really even the most minimal of encryption is enough to invoke the protections of this law. What probably is not enough is, is you know, uh, a physical or digital label that says please don't copy this or please don't inspect this code. That's not enough. But you know, ROP 13 is probably enough. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. So I want to apologize to everyone here and everyone else who does it because I'm partly responsible via my contacts with AT&T's uh, lobbyists way back when for a crucial error in the DMCA. It talks about encryption research, not cryptographic research. And encryption is defined as scrambling or unscrambling. It includes hash functions, digital signatures, and all the other lovely things we like to play with. So I want to apologize to everybody. There's plenty of blame to go around. <laughs> we should actually probably move on to the, to the next section. So thanks, Mitch. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah.